You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests every week. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google and other places where you get podcasts. You can expect to get, or please subscribe rather, I should say, and give me a five-star rating. If you like what you hear, I always appreciate that. And then also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And if you want to reach me regarding those, you can get me at thatgratitudeguy.com. Or as you can see in the background too, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. Or by email at david at thatgratitudeguy. So let me get on to the show and introduce to my guests. Always my favorite part of any show and the majority of it is my special guest. No exception this week, Morgan Oaks, Dr. Mo as we know him. Dr. Morgan Oaks is a transformational speaker, coach, and healer who empowers the conscious cultivation of body, mind, and spirit through the process of intuitive listening and courageously inspired action. Dr. Moe's motto is, I want for you what you want for yourself. His tools and skills include being a chiropractor, certified high-performance coach, NLP practitioner, shamanic healer, and energy worker. Dr. Morgan blends ancient wisdom with the tools of modern transformation to bring synergy to healing and evolution. So Dr. Mo, welcome to the show. Dude, always, always great to be in conversation with you. Likewise, likewise. And um, so tell people, Dr. Mo, we always start out or I always start out rather just for the context of how you and I met. Well, and I just remembered that you and I were speaking at a little event uh, just slightly north of Seattle uh, and I believe we got paid with Mexican food for speaking. I at think that so. Event. Yeah. And that would have been, gosh, maybe 2013 or 12 or 14. That sounds, that sounds in the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 Well, and I just, you know, and I love, and for a long time, to be honest, I couldn't remember your name, but I always like, oh, that gratitude guy, yeah. right? It's just so easy to remember. And it's uh, your story is just such a beautiful one. And um yeah, glad that uh, we're we're still doing it here almost a decade later. Yep, and I remember when I met you, just thinking, "Why wow, I love this guy instantly." You know, you just there's certain people you just connect with, and and uh, and other people that it's not that you don't connect as much. It just doesn't have the same resonance or something. There's just something about it that's like, "Well, nice to meet you." And you think, "Well, if I see him again, great. If I don't," but I remember you and I started kind of connecting, and then we found out we shared the same birthday, so we knew that was something special. Uh, just a couple of decades and a half apart, though, but still the same birthday. So, so I always like to kind of back up. And if you think where you were 10 years ago with when you and I met, but even maybe before that, you have had, in my opinion, some really interesting career paths and to, career things. And you've kind of, I love the word reinvent yourself. There's a lot of, there's a couple of celebrities and people that they use that word with. And I always think it's so cool. Somebody starts out with one thing and then you hear the term been there, done that and things like that's time to do something else, but kind of walk back and start maybe in the beginning uh, in the twenties or sort of when you stir, I believe it was first headed towards chiropractic and talk about, cause you've got two or three major chunks of your life. And I'm going to want to talk about Central America as well. But let's start back kind of back with the, the first journey that you're on. How did that start? Well, so you know, I got into mechanical engineering as far as professional journeys uh, because I was good at math and science. And I, you know, I grew up in this little town in Wyoming where you, know, you worked on dirt bikes and snowmobiles. And so I was good at mechanical things and in, you know, like math things. And so I became a mechanical engineer, you know, went to school for that and I think it was about my, my junior year, I came home for Christmas and I told my parents, hey, I may, I'm thinking about dropping out of engineering school to go to chiropractic school. Mm. And I just, you know, starting in eighth grade, had tremendous results with chiropractic following uh, an initial sports injury and then a multitude of sports injuries after that. And what I decided at that time was I was just, 
I was kind of burnt out on school. I didn't want the debt. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to get an engineering degree and find uh, you know, a job where they want a personality as well. So I looked at like engineering sales and looked at other blends of like a personality and engineering. And yeah, I graduated from school, was an engineer for about three years before. Um, yeah, really looking for like, how can I own my own business, not be behind a computer all day. And that kind of brought me back into, you know, starting this chiropractic journey. So, so Morgan, was it really, if I hear you correctly, some of the sports injuries or actually visiting a chiropractor that got you started to thinking about what a cool profession that would be? Is that kind of how it first started? Yeah. And it's interesting. I never thought of myself as a healer or somebody that like was overtly concerned about the rest of humanity or, or people in general. Um, but with that chiropractic piece, you know, I was referring friends, family members, you know, other coworkers at my engineering firm, I was referring a lot of people into chiropractic. And I was like, Oh, wow, like, I really do care about this. And it helps a lot of people. I've had tremendous results. And, and, and when I first started looking at it, I was also playing rugby. And I'm like, and I could go be a, you know, scholarship athlete and have my school paid for. So there were a lot of things that just made sense. Extra. And you know, I was just thinking as you answered that, that as long as I've known you, we've decided 10 years or closing in on 10 years, give or take. I don't think I've ever asked you this question. I have been a huge fan of chiropractic for a long time ago. And it was taught to me about if you're driving a car with a bent frame, it's not going to drive straight and you need to get your frame straight. And so the circulation and the nerves and everything go properly through their channels. But why, in your opinion, having been so close to it, why do you think there was that sort of school of thought, maybe not as much anymore, that somehow chiropractic wasn't as, as real as the real doctor or wasn't, it wasn't advised as much for than, you know, unless you're cutting somebody open and giving them pills or something. Why do you think there was that sort of, that sort of feeling towards chiropractic? That's, I'm just going to give the, the most honest answer. Um, for a long time, there was a very strong push by the American Medical Association to really not allow chiropractic to have its piece in the healing world. Wow. Um, in the, I believe it was in 1981, the, uh, there was a, a chiropractor that took the American Medical Association all the way to the Supreme Court. And basically, it was an antitrust lawsuit that was that was put forth there. And, and at that time, as I remember it, in the you know, kind of the guidelines for the AMA, it said you cannot refer to chiropractors. And there was even something kind of saying, and we kind of recommend against even being friends with them. Wow. And so when you think about the power of the medical industry and of, you know, what the, the voice of somebody wearing a white coat, you know, means mm -hmm. to all of us, mm -hmm. um, I think that was a big part of it. And, you know, and the reality is there's more research done every year by a single college in the medical profession than the entire chiropractic profession wow. put together, right? So there's, you know, all the commercials, there's just so many things that go into it. And, you know, there's a reason they call it alternative healthcare. We're, we're not that, that primary line, or at least we haven't been historically. Well, and you think about too, the, the power of the AMA and the, the, just the medical association that it is. And I think certainly in the past, but, but more specifically through COVID, we've seen the power of the pharmaceuticals. And who really has the, the power here and who has the money and the control. And it's nice to think we have this free society, but in many times money controls a lot more than we realize. So as you got into chiropractic, what was kind of the best thing in those early years of the practice? I mean, I can imagine helping people, but what made you want to keep doing it? And, and just, I'm sure you enjoyed it, but what was the best part of it? It really was helping people, you know, and even that has a growth edge. I think everything we step into that's, you know, not uh, already in our wheelhouse has a growth edge. And one of the early things for me to overcome was that I started realizing I cared about people's health more than they did. Mm. In many instances, you know, I would give suggestions to somebody. I'm like, oh, just cut these foods out of your diet. And a lot of what you're coming to me for will go away. Right. So it wasn't something that made me any money. It was just things that empowered those people. And, and it was a real like kind of mental and emotional struggle to realize that a lot of what I said fell on deaf ears. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so finding my balance with that, a lot of lessons also in, you know, small business entrepreneurship and time management and a lot of other things. But ultimately, I have some of the best success stories and connections with people because, you know, in many cases, I was able to do for them what nobody else in any part of the medical industry had been able to do for them. And so, you know, oh, just really being able to empower people and, and, and support people has been 
something that's driven all the things that I do for like the last, gosh, since 2004, when I graduated from chiropractic school. And that's really neat because it is about helping people. And they say, you know, if you want to help yourself, help other people. And I think it's so true. I find that really interesting. I cared more about someone's health than they did. And for some reason, I'm always looking for explanations to these things. I've said before in this podcast and other talks about one of my biggest questions on life is I don't understand why people don't take better care of themselves. It just doesn't make sense to me. But what did you find that to be positive versus negative? What did you find? How were you able to break through to those people so they cared as much about their health as you did? Was there something that the way you explained it to them or put it to them that really was able to get them on the same track as you thought they should be on? Yeah, it's, you know, I think there's that pendulum in life where we go from one extreme to another. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, ultimately, I just, there was one guy I remember, and my, my dad, you know, growing up, very blue collar guy, construction guy, I think he went to the chiropractor when he needed to, mm -hmm. you know, we had another guy in town that he went to the chiropractor once a month, and we're like, oh, my God, what are you doing? And that's, you know, be a more, uh, you know, <laughs> more like maintenance or prevention care, it was just very strange for us. And I remember this guy coming into my, my business, and I'm like, oh, this is a dude like my dad. And I showed him these horrible x-rays, you know, his neck was just in such rough shape. And I didn't speak my complete truth about what I thought he needed. Hmm. You know, I was young, I was out of school, I'm trying to like, make sure I pay the bills. But I also, you know, just wasn't in my truth. And I remember when he left my office, I felt probably like a version of shame. I'm like, wow, like, I wasn't honest with him. So really anything that happens to his neck and the rest of his life, like I have to take some ownership in that. Wow. And I think what that shifted for me was I don't necessarily need people to like me, but what I do need to do is I need to be honest in a way that they can hear it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's really just helped me like, you know, you may not want to hear this or the other things that you, you've done in your past may not align with this. But at least from my professional point of view, this is what I would share with you. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And par that's part of what's really helped me. And the other half is, you know, I always say, like, if a dentist didn't tell you about the toothbrush, he's a horrible person, right? right. <laughs> right? right. He or she are a horrible person. And, and so I spend half my time educating on things they can do on their own that will never make me any money and will change the rest of their life. Yeah, I'm really big on empowerment. And then I try to balance that out with just, you know, speaking my professional opinion and, and then letting people make up their own minds. Well, and knowing you as long as I've known too, you set a very good example. And I've always felt in raising children's I've raised children, I've raised two sons and then managing people and I managed a lot of people in previous uh, jobs of managing big stores is the number one skill set you need is to set a good example. And you've always set a really good example. I mean, when you're fit, you and I have gone on walks together and gone out to nature and, and had a lot of really interesting discussions around health and so forth. And it's so important to practice what you preach. And even sometimes when I'm talking about gratitude, I'll find myself all of a sudden going down the wrong road. And I think, whoa, wait a second here. You're going down the negative path here, my friend. You're preaching gratitude. So you got to make sure you set that good example. But so what was kind of next? Because I know there was the NLP and the, you mentioned the shamanic healer and energy worker. And, and at some point too, we'll talk about the, the high performance coaching. But what was kind of the next evolution of, of Dr. Mo after the chiropractic piece? Yeah, so I, I describe it kind of like a, a bad country Western song. You know, there was a series of quote unquote, unfortunate events where I crashed my truck, you know, lost my dog, lost my girl, lost my house. And at that point, I thought I was going to lose my chiropractic business as well. I was at that, you know, that first new business hump where you're not sure if you're going to make it over, over the, uh, the edge to success or not. And at that point, I had a, a spiritual awakening, you know, really started um, experiencing a lot of synchronicities, having a lot more intuition, meeting some very, very strange people, and also hearing words I had never heard before. And so that took me down kind of a path of, you know, partially studying quantum physics, but, you know, largely studying more esoteric, you know, worldwide traditions around healing and, and shamanism and energy work. And that really created a, a big transition in my life. And, and the reality is, you know, after four years in chiropractic business, I was burnt out. Oh, you know, interesting. I was learning lessons in some very difficult ways. And so I stepped away from that business and took a pause. And when I came back into it, like a year and a half later, it was with the intention of really blending 
you know, some of these energy processes and all of these different processes, because you mentioned NLP. And so what's interesting, I remember sitting in a purely research driven chiropractic convention symposium, and there was a research study they shared that said of the top 10 predictors for chronic low back pain, only three of them are physical. Wow. Right. And wow. you know how strong mindset is like you yep, base yep. your, your whole speaking career on positivity and gratitude. Right. right and so right, right. what I realized was if I'm not doing the things to affect all those other aspects, like I'm really not helping people as much as I think, mm-hmm. you know, so like NLP, it's a great way to change the unconscious mind. And, uh, you know, I always say a lot of what I do in my practice, if somebody in a white coat gives you a diagnosis of something, a lot of times that's, that's the modern day curse, right? right. You think you're going to hold right. that forever. And, but the, the truth is the body's always trying to heal itself. We're always moving towards a state of wholeness and healthiness. And so I keep blending things in like neurolinguistic programming to help change people's unconscious mind to let them know they can, you know, to, to have them actually believe that they can become better, mm-hmm. you know, and just kept adding all these things into my practice to where, you know, some people really need, you know, help with like a broken heart. Exactly. You know, we, we've all and, experienced that. So. And Morgan, for those that don't know neurolinguistic programming, how would you kind of, you sort of did, but how would you kind of define that to those that may not know what that is? So what NLP says, I believe, is like 10% of our brain is the conscious part. That's the eight part we're able to track. 90% is the unconscious part. And that's how we can say we're going to stop doing something. Mm. And we find ourselves doing it five minutes later. Oh, so wow. NLP goes in. And if we think of the uh, unconscious mind like a record player, NLP goes in and smooths out those grooves and helps us create grooves in our unconscious you know, our unconscious mind that are actually going to serve, you know, the pieces of our life we're wanting to positively impact. So it's just mm-hmm. a great way to, to reset the unconscious mind. Yeah, that's excellent. And then uh, we're going to get to Central America in a second, which I want to make sure uh, the listeners hear about that, because I think that's fascinating. But talk a little bit about the, the certified high performance coach, because you got into coaching too. And I think in some ways you could think that's kind of an outgrowth of that. But how did that journey start and continue for you? Yeah, well, if we start at my chiropractic practice, I could get somebody's spine very, very healthy, their body would be feeling great. But if the rest of their life is a mess, you know, life's still not complete. Mm -hmm. And so I had started kind of mentoring people, I was trained in mentorship, and I was doing that. And I was doing these other aspects. And um, Brendan Burchard is somebody I'd really looked up to as far as personal growth, his books, his seminars, his online stuff. And he offered a way to get certified in the coaching program he's been offering to his clients for the last decade. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really feel like he's in integrity. I like who he is as a man. I like his messaging and I love how strict he is about his research. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when I found out about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was already doing some professional speaking. And I thought, what a great way to add this really researched framework into what I'm doing so I can do even better of a job of helping people. Yeah. And so that's what pulled me in. And, you know, and at this point I blend my coaching, energy work, NLP, chiropractic, you know, you just blend all of it together really with the hope that, you know, whatever transformation is, you know, most wanted by the client, but also most going to serve the client that comes through. Well, and so many of those things, they're all, different modalities that are leading to transformation. And I think that's what I think so many people are looking for. And I'm still fascinated to always stay positive. And I talk about gratitude turns, which you haven't to enough. And so it's all about seeing the glass half full. But I just, it's so exciting to me doing some similar work that you do, Dr. Mo, and just seeing people that want to transform their life. I always like the line somebody once said, if you want to change your life, change your life. You know, and it's just interesting how, uh, who care the other people I can't help them too much but they talk about it and they never make a change but people that make a change that go through and quit smoking and lose a bunch of weight or change their job or get out of a bad relationship or get a new career going or whatever I just have so much uh, admiration for because it's not easy and I think it's it's kind of like the whole I grew up in the 50s and 60s and the whole fast food it was just it's so terrible for you but it's just just drive in and pay five bucks and you get this food and you're gone but it's just horrible for you compared to going home and making a good cooked meal with fresh vegetables and, and, you know, so on and so forth. And so, but as you got into that, did you find that 
is there a certain kind of person you can kind of tell up front that is really from your first conversations with them that's really willing to make those changes when they want transformation? Yeah, unfortunately, this statement might be incredibly true in this in this area, and I'll, I'll see if you agree. Like objects in motion tend to stay in motion, mm, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes the longer a pain point has been in our life without us, you know, stepping away from it, I think we can define our lives by it. I think the, you know, the energy necessary to move away from it becomes bigger. The courage that's necessary, like there's there's so many things about that, and so. You know, most of the people I work with, a lot of times I'll say like, you're already sharpened into a sword. We're mm -hmm. just going to make you a samurai sword. Oh, nice. You know, and, and for people that, that aren't willing to do the work, you know, it's, it's really tough. You know, we like that saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't get them to drink. And so, right. so true. You know, yeah. I try to, I try to meet people where they are and take them where they're wanting to go. And, you know, and, and as you know, like courage is different for everybody. Yeah. Some people courage is speaking in front of a thousand people for some people courage is having a voice within their family. Yeah, that's a good you know? point. And, and certainly is gratitude such a part of my life. How has gratitude figured in and been a part of Morgan's life? You know, I th honestly, I think I'm a bit hard hardwired with it. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen a study about this, but I tend to look at things as something to be grateful for. You know, even the struggles and it's funny, I'll be talking with my girlfriend and something will come up and I'm like, yeah, what a, what a blessing, what a gift, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think in a way I'm just kind of hardwired to that. And luckily I've been around people like you and I, I've read enough, you know, personal growth that I know that when I'm down in the muck, that's something I can do to get myself out of it. Absolutely. And I also know that it's, it's that thing you use to stay vibrating up above the stress, up above the difficulty. So, you know, I use it as a way to stay high vibrating. And sometimes when I just get knocked down in general, I use it as that boost to get me up to where I need to be to get through the day. You mentioned something that is very important to me. I, I talk about those eight or 10 things that are just should be part, shouldn't, you know, should is not a good word, but you want to consider having part of your daily routine and getting eight hours of sleep and drinking your water and drinking and eating nutritious food, taking your supplements, writing in the gratitude journal. But I mentioned something else in that whole thing is hanging out with positive people. You're known by the company you keep. And you mentioned what you've learned from me. I've learned a lot from you. And it's just, it makes sense. And it's like the old, the, verb, the inverse of that is one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. And, and you hang out. I've, I've had some people I've hung out with. I don't hang out with anymore because it just wasn't healthy for me. And it was always negative. And, you know, it's a choice. I say in my talks every day, you can get out of bed and you can be positive or negative, up or down, left or right, grateful or ungrateful. It's your choice. And nobody gets to get in that brain and rewire that brain. So it's so very important. But when I look again, when I look at your life, where, if possible, where do you think you're very motivated, very driven, have been since you were young, where do you think that came from that drive? That's interesting. Like sometimes you hear about that, that, you know, famous actor, actress that, you know, grew up almost homeless. And so they've got this incredible drive for success and money that's, yep. you know, maybe based on a, a wound, we might say. Um, for me, I think I was good at school kind of inherently and I like learning and I, you know, I, I think there's a part of me that thinks that I should do whatever's as difficult as I can within my own reach, mm -hmm. right? Like I can't imagine going to the gym and lifting half the weight of what's possible. And even when I went to chiropractic school, like I, I, I really wanted to get a football scholarship, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But the places that offered engineering were kind of a little too big based on my, who I was as a football player. And so I had looked and I probably could have got, you know, been able to play football at like a smaller teacher's college some of the ones that were around where I was at. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to do like a teaching degree for me. I was like, it's not going to push me as hard as I want to be pushed. Right. right. I knew engineering would be a stretch. I knew it was kind of at the, at the end of what I was at that time able to do. And so I think there's a part of me that just always feels like to be in that growth edge feels really normal to be in that area where what I love to do is meeting what's going to serve, you know, somebody else as well. Like, I think those things really keep me in a place of, of motivation and, and personal growth. 
And you know, that's the second time you've said that. I really like that word growth edge. I don't know if I've heard you say, but that's really, it's kind of describing a mindset really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. and I'm doing the, the, the 75 hard right now, mm -hmm. which I really can't say enough positive about. It's, you know, a couple workouts a day, a gallon of water a day, eat in a specific way that feels healthy to you. Uh, read 10 pages in a personal growth book. And when I've been kind of studying into this process, um, I know when I've done difficult things in the past, it's just skyrocketed everything in my life, right? And so in doing this, you know, one of the things that's kind of shared in the process is that what they feel is that for us to truly be happy, we need to be in a growth edge, mm -hmm. right? And if you think about like, if somebody retires and they don't have something they're doing, there can be decline that happens in there. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. if, you know if, there, if we sell the business and there's enough money, there can be decline. You know, if, if a child, you know, a kid has everything handed to them on a silver platter, a lot of times there's nothing to pull them forward that they're excited about or passionate about. And so I think, I think, you know, that balance of like, have a goal, have something you're moving into that you, you care about and that you're striving for, and also be completely happy with where you're at. Yeah. That's really, you know? that's, I think that's really a great thought. And I think at my age, um, I have a number of friends that are retired and it's, it's not, I'm, I'm a fan of, I don't give somebody my opinion unless they ask for it. And I don't like the word advice. And so I just listen. And if somebody says, what do you think about this? I'll be happy to, to comment on it. But, but I think I, at least it passes through my mind. I just think some of my friends and acquaintances are getting without, are in a position where they don't have much of a purpose anymore. And I think it can be potentially problematic. And whether it's relationships, their health, all those kinds of things, I think it's important. I think we're kind of, you mentioned hardwired for gratitude. I think we're kind of hardwired to have a purpose. And I think at some point when that's taken away, um, that it, as I say, it could be potentially problematic. But um, the one thing though that, oh, I wanted to say that I want to make sure I get this in too, and that is tell the listeners and the viewers, because this goes out on YouTube as well, uh, tell, tell them about your Central America experience, because I just am fascinated by that. Not once, but twice, I believe. I don't think it could have been three times, but tell them about the initial plan there, because I think a lot of viewers and listeners would find real inspiration in that. Well, it's so wild because with the background in engineering and then chiropractic, and I added in physical therapy and, you know, so much of my life has been based on research. Mm -hmm. And the Central America thing is like the opposite muscle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, after the spiritual awakening, I started having little intuitions about things that my day to day stuff, business stuff, but I started having bigger intuitions as well. And I'd had four intuitions around traveling to Central America. So they were, you know, start in Mexico and travel south, something big will happen in Guatemala, kept seeing different versions of my own death in Panama. And then I, I had an intuition that I would come home early from this trip for my dad's funeral, even though he wasn't sick at the time. And so I, you know, collected those visions over the series of a couple of years. And then I was able to go on that trip uh, starting in 2010. And, you know, I started in Mexico, something big did happen in Guatemala. And then, you know, I was still in Guatemala and I received an email that my dad had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Oh, wow. Well. So I did come home early from that trip. And yet I think one of the biggest blessings I've had is got to spend six weeks with him before he passed. Mm -hmm. You know, so many beautiful things happen with our family, with our relationship, with connection, you know. And so then for the 10 years when I was in Seattle, I was waiting to go back on that trip to finish the aspect, you know, th that death, that personal death in Panama. And so just a few months ago, actually, I was able to, um, sell my practice in Seattle to move back to Colorado. And it was time to go on this trip. So I was able to go down and travel down to Panama. And I really, you know, you never know what's going to happen in life. How many people every year die, you know, in the shower or the bathtub. Exactly. Right. But I really felt like it was like egoic death. Like mm -hmm. a part of me is getting ready to transition so that I can step more fully into who I need to be you know, in this lifetime. And so, yeah, really listening to intuitions and, and, you know, following those things has been a big part of my life. And yeah, that's it, including the TEDx talk that I did in 2016. That's, that's really more in depth about that first part of the trip and, you know, give seven key takeaways for listeners to improve their own intuition.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is neat. So if you look back and I I think about arguably a very successful life and and a number of, you know, four or five different sort of directions and, and uh, minor course corrections, I always use the flying term. Um, as, as you kind of look where you are now, uh, what would you tell the person that was starting out, you know, here, young lady, young man, uh, here's a couple of pointers that I would give you from my 40 plus, 45 plus years on the planet uh, that would help you. What would you tell them if they were starting out to kind of take something away from your vast level of experience? Yeah, I'll share two things. So the first thing might have a couple parts. The first thing is trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a saying that we don't have the ability to ask a question where we don't already have the answer. Mm -hmm. Right. There's things, some of the most successful, successful business people on the planet, including Steve Jobs. You know, I've got a great quote from him about intuition. Oprah talks about intuition. You know, some of these like household worldwide names speak about intuition. So I really put it back on the people that there's a lot of stuff always going on outside of us, but inside of us we have the truth there, mm-hmm, right? And mm-hmm. really to trust into that. You know, I also think along with that, people think that clarity is a destination. Clarity is not a destination. It's a verb. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not a noun. It's a verb. It's an action. We're always looking for more clarity. And if somebody thinks they want to go back to school, but they don't know the pathway to get there, the first piece of clarity and action might be getting on some websites and looking about what loans are available Yeah. or do, does the school that you're most attracted to offer the courses that you're interested in? Or maybe it's having a conversation with somebody who knows more than you do about the process. So first piece of advice, trust what's inside of you. The second piece of advice is ready, fire, aim. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a friend once and, and by that ready, fire, aim, many times we have to take the shot before we totally know where we're headed. Right. And I had a buddy say that if you do a, if you do, you know, 10 things at hundred percent accuracy, you get 10 things done. Mm-hmm. If you do a hundred things at a C average, you get 70 things done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I think for most people, we can drag our heels too long because we don't have all the answers. And the truth is you never have all the answers when you start. Yeah, that's true. You know? So just start. So I like the ready, fire, aim. It's a really, really great analogy. And I think earlier you said something I was going to mention. Somebody had said once to me, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotten. And so you do want to always be growing. And I just think it's so important. And I think another thing, and this was from another speaker I heard years ago, was never leave the site of making a decision without doing something towards its attainment. So if I think I want to be a life coach, the first time I do right, I'm going to call Dr. Mo and ask him a couple of questions about, so do it right now, do something towards its attainment because it's so easy. Well, I'll just get to that tomorrow. And I think we, we sometimes live in a world of procrastinators anywhere anyway. And I think so often uh, trust yourself, ready, fire, aim. You mentioned clarity is a verb. It's take action, just, you know, do something. And even if it's wrong, it's okay. You're doing something. It's just so easy to sit back in the easy chair and never do anything. And so, um, well, that's excellent. Well, we gotta, we've got to wrap up and I want to ask you, it's, I, I've kind of hinted around with kind of this kind of question, but, but I love this question to, to kind of bring it to a close. What, what's the number one thing, maybe two things, but the number one thing Uh, And I I appreciate the trust yourself, but if somebody had said to Morgan Oaks uh, at 18 that, you know, today that really would have helped you. uh, And again, I think the trust yourself in the brain might might be part of it. It's something that from your, from all this experience that really would have made a difference in your life. If you knew this, you know it now, but if you knew it at 18, what would that be? Yeah, I think it's a version of that. Don't play it safe. Mm, I like that. You know, don't, uh, you know, if you want to live in a tree house, don't build your house at the foot of a tree. Yeah. You know, you want to be a, a doctor, don't become a nurse. You know, you want, to, you want to get married to this amazing person, don't settle for an unhealthy, unfulfilling relationship. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, it, I really feel like the word settle is a four-letter word, meaning it just feels like a cuss word to me. Yeah, that's it. I love that. Don't settle too. And I think a lot of us do. And it, it takes a great deal of, of, you know, courage or stamina, whatever you want to call it, something guts, I guess, another word to really go out there and do something. And it's like the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, better to have, have failed, dared greatly and failed in the arena versus the, 
the guy that sits back and criticize everybody, but he never even gets in the arena type of thing. And, and just to see what you can do. There was the five regrets of the dying. I mentioned that every so often about the people that were in their nineties that were uh, uh, interviewed. And there was a number of them. I wish I'd kept more in touch with friends. And I, I think that's a good one. And I wish I had um, been truer to the life I wanted for myself than others wanted for me, which was one, but the one that resonated with me the most is I wish I'd taken more chances. And I just think people play it very conservative and then they get older and now they can't physically, emotionally, financially, they can't necessarily do it. And it's just so important. I mean, it, it flies by and I realize you and I are 25 years apart, but it just, is, it seems like I was just in high school, college, just a couple of years ago. And here we are 50 years later. It's, it's really strange. So don't play it safe and don't settle. So well, thank you, Dr. Mo. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being on the show. Tremendous nuggets of advice. And I love that growth edge and that 75 hard you mentioned too. But um, gosh, the spiritual awakenings, that's another thing. So, well, thank you again. And to the listeners, my podcast, just as a reminder, is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating. I appreciate that. And I know people are struggling with a lot of life issues, especially after the last 18 months in the pandemic. And I have a program called my Gratitude Coaching Program that will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationship, your career, your life's journey that you want to change, then this is the program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is priced at $4,500, and my podcast listeners, as my podcast listeners, you will receive an extra month of coaching for free and you can get a hold of me at thatgratitudeguy.com or david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And one final thing, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute, a 60 second video goes out every single Monday at 6.15 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time. You can go to your text and just text gratitude guy to 22828. The number is five digits, 22828. And then the message box, type in gratitude guy, and that'll get you signed up for the Monday morning minute. So once again, to the listeners and viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate the support. And as I tell you every week, I'm that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.